Are you working on your author career, but struggling to get that first book published? Does the goal of being an author seem too lofty? Or are thoughts of having multiple books and making a full-time living are as fantastical as living in Cinderella's castle? Welcome to Discovered Wordsmiths, a podcast where aspiring authors can be heard. Join Steven Schneider as he finds and talks to authors you may not know, but authors that have gotten their foot on the author career path. Hear what they've done to get there and where they want to go now. Settle back. It's time for a bit of inspiration and advice. Come listen to today's Discovered Wordsmith. Author stuff, more the business side of it um, and things. So before we get started talking about our topic, uh, which I have several questions on, um, what are some things you have learned with your first book that you're doing differently with your next couple books? My first book was published almost by chance. I, I entered in a contest that a hybrid publisher was offering. Um, having had the chance to work with a hybrid publisher, I think I'd like to have a chance to self-publish one of my books to see how it would feel to have a little more control over the books. Um, the publisher that I worked with did make a lot of points about the marketability of the book that I hadn't considered. They brought up issues about the manuscript that might make it difficult to create an audio adaptation. It talked about audience expectations and how to pitch the book to readers. And those are all things that I never thought about. I, I'm looking at the book from the artistic perspective about the story I want to tell and not necessarily thinking about the nitty gritty features. Okay. So now that I have a little bit of prep as to what goes into marketing a book, I'm going to be a little bit more aware of those issues, as, whether I end up self-publishing it or whether I publish it traditionally. Um, but I'm going to have to think about how those factors are going to impinge on my narratives. Okay, Let, let's talk a little bit more about ink shares because I'm not familiar with them and they sound like something uh, other authors may be interested in. So you said they do a, like a crowdfunding. So essentially they have a whole big list of books and the ones that get the most attention and votes are the ones they help promote and get out into the world. Does that sound accurate? I don't know that Inkshares does the promotion. I think the authors have to do the promotion. I, I know another author uh, socially who had his book picked up by Inkshares last year after he did a crowdfunding campaign. So he had to, to reach out to all the people in his social circle and his professional circle to make them aware of what he was offering. Uh, the public has to come in and show interest in your book by pre-ordering a book. I think they have a, a new feature now where you don't necessarily have to pre-order, but you can just express interest in a book. And when you get enough people who demonstrate that they're willing to buy the book to, that, to show that there is an audience for it, then Inkshares will agree to, to fund it for you. And they'll do the editing, the design of the cover, the layout, they'll do the marketing. Inkshares has a lot of good contacts in different media companies. They do have a way of getting the books into major brick and mortar stores like Barnes and Noble. Uh, so that was what attracted me to the publisher initially because I am not a marketer and I, I really didn't want to have to deal with that aspect of the book publishing business. So having a company do that all for me sounded very attractive. Right, right. And I assume then there's a uh, agreement or whatever that they take a percent uh, and you would get a smaller percent than if you put it out uh, on your own. Is that correct? Anytime you set up uh, a project with Inkshares, you do have to agree to the terms. They, they have a, a very short document called the publishing contract that lays out the terms that you described, how you break down the author's share of the profits, uh, exactly what type of work Inkshare will do to create your book and to market your book. They also talk about media adaptations, film adaptations, foreign licensing rights, uh, the major things that you would be concerned about as an author. For the contest, they work a little bit differently because there's no crowdfunding or maybe not sufficient crowdfunding to have the book published. Inkshares will do the financial backing itself and they do issue a different contract uh, to talk about how the author will pay back the publication costs before the royalties kick in. So depending on the route you pursue, whether you get the crowdfunding or you get the contest winning, uh, you may have slightly different terms with ink shares. Okay. And you sound like you've been happy with them though for the work that they have done. 
I think they did a beautiful job with Smithy, although I will say that it was a bit of a bumpy road to get to the, the final version of the book. I think because a lot of the authors who come to Inkshares don't have a, a finished product, maybe they just have a really good idea and, and a few enticing chapters. I think Inkshares is accustomed to having more creative control over the product. When I entered Smithy in the contest, I did have a complete manuscript and I submitted a complete manuscript. I think Inkshares was more intrigued by the concept of the book than by the execution. And from the beginning, they tried to have me make some pretty major changes to the book. Uh, I wrote the book in an epistolary format. I was told that I ought to rewrite it completely as a straight narrative, maybe have some sections as an epistolary, uh, as a diary or as a letter, but not the entire thing. And I considered the idea and I rejected it because I chose epistolary style for a reason. For one thing, I wanted to create a sense of realism as, as if this really were a study that had happened and you're looking at all the documents about it. I also wanted to create mystery about the characters, who is a reliable narrator and who is not. Uh, filtering the story through individual characters' perspectives gives me the opportunity to do that and writing it as a narrative wouldn't necessarily allow that. Um, other changes that Inkshare suggested were to push the book more heavily into the overt horror category. They really wanted me to build up the ghost. They really wanted me to build up the dark history of the house. And for me, I wanted to make the possibility of the ghost an ambiguous factor. You don't know if there really is a spirit or if the characters are imagining that there's a spirit or if Smithy may even be manipulating his keepers into thinking that there's a spirit. Maybe the, the chimp is responsible for all the mischief that's taking place. Um, so we did have some lengthy discussions about the creative direction of the story. Uh, I was really surprised by how Inkshares was trying to rewrite the book in some ways. And I wondered why did they choose my story for the contest if they weren't completely happy with it. But again, I think they're used to looking at the samples and, and not knowing if there is a finished product because I did have a finished product. My story was already set and maybe not as malleable as, as they were used to seeing. But we did end up coming to a, a compromise and we did agree on the final version and, and they did a beautiful job with the publication. It looks like a lovely book. They had a great cover artist and they were able to secure some some influential reviews for me. So I'm happy with the work that they've done. Yeah, it sounds like it. And I actually like that because you hear a lot about these vanity presses that try and rip people off and they don't do anything. Uh, they say they provide editing and people get back a book and they say, no, this is great just the way it is. So there's no editing whatsoever. And personally, I think some of my best learning and growing as a writer has been when somebody has gone through and provided me some sort of feedback, whether an editor or you know another author or something like that. So it sounds like you learned a lot and got a lot from what they gave you. Even if you didn't go with it, at least they were giving you a reason this is why you should do that and you can think about it. Yes, yeah, some of their feedback was um, shaped by marketing factors that I hadn't considered. When I wrote certain sections of the book that were based on filmed evidence of what the chimpanzee was doing, I wrote it as a screenplay. I was taking a screenwriting course at a local community college. And so I did most of my writing for the book in the class sessions. Um, the editor told me that it would be very difficult to record an audiobook using that format and, and suggested that I change it to a narrative. Actually, he initially suggested that I should change those sections to one of the characters viewing the film, but I, I didn't want to do that because I didn't want to filter those scenes through a character's perspective. I wanted those recordings to act as the objective evidence to just show what's happening on the camera without anybody interpreting it. Let the reader determine what's going on. Another factor that was brought up was the length of the chapters. Some of the chapters are fairly lengthy, others are short, just a few paragraphs or under a page. And I was encouraged to cut those chapters because it would make the audiobook run more smoothly. And my response was, but those chapters have meaning. I, I wrote them for a reason. I just, I, I don't listen to audiobooks myself, so I, I never thought about what goes into the recording of a book or what makes a good audiobook. And they were bringing up points that never would have occurred to me because I don't have that background. Yeah. 
I think that's interesting uh, that they did that. So are you using them for your next couple books? I do have another manuscript that I've submitted to them. When I wrote Smithy, it, it turned out to be a very lengthy manuscript and I made the decision to split it into two books. At the time that I was shopping it around, a lot of publishers wanted to look at trilogies or series. So I offered Smithy as a two book series. The book that's been published in April is the first part of the initial book that I wrote. So I've submitted the second half to Inkshares and, and we'll see what they decide to do about it. Okay, and, and if not, are you gonna self-publish the second half still to keep them connected? Oh, I, oh yes, I intend to do that. I definitely want the rest of Smithy's story to get out. Okay, um, and you mentioned earlier that you did dictation uh, and fairly early and young. Uh, on cassette tape even. I love that. Um, so do you still do dictation? Yes, although I didn't do it for Smithy. I typed most of that at the computer, um, but my sequel to The Turn of the Screw was largely dictated onto cassette tape. Uh, my King Kong book was largely dictated onto cassette tape, and then I end up transcribing it and, and reviewing it and tightening it up, getting it nice and grammatically accurate and then brushing up the scenes that I think need a little bit of work. But one of the advantages of dictating onto cassette is that I can get my ideas out right away. A lot of what goes into the story ends up being uh, very off the cuff, very improvised. So I can get through the book fairly quickly just by vomiting the words onto the tape, if you will. Um, and then the, the real work comes with editing it after the fact. Right. As opposed to me sitting at a computer looking at a blank page for half an hour trying to think about what to type. Right. right. When the cassette is running, I've just got to say what comes to my mind. And that's kind of what I hear a lot with dictation, that it gives you the framework, either very basic or, you know, most of it. And then you edit and get out the rest of the story. It's kind of like, you know, polishing the clay, I guess, uh, afterwards. That's a good way to describe it. So. Um, Besides the dictation, now do you type, do you listen and type it, or do you have auto transcribe uh, take care of that? I did invest in a transcription program last year. Prior to that, I would have to type everything from the cassettes. And, and when I worked in a law office that had dictation machines, it was easy to do that. I could stay late after work and pop my cassette into the tape and then, and then type away. I could operate the machine with my feet and type with the keyboard. When I'm at home, I have to frequently stop and start the cassette as I'm rewinding it and replaying it to type what I say. Uh, the dictation program unfortunately does not seem to respond to my voice very well so i'm probably going to have to go back to typing up the cassette myself i would see a lot of typos and a lot of missed words so either i need to learn how to elocute better or i need to find a different program um well uh, i was going to ask what software you use but uh that would be something i'd recommend there's a service out there called otter.ai o-t-t-e-r.ai and you could take your files from the cassette and record them onto the computer and then just drop that audio file onto um, Otter AI and it'll transcribe it. Uh, I, I've had very good results with it. So something to check out. That sounds great. I've never heard of Otter. Most people that I've seen in writing communities talk about a, a program called Dragon. But I know that there are a number of different softwares out there. And then you can also just talk to Siri and hope that Siri right. can understand what you're saying. Right. Well, I know Otter AI is big, but there's another one called Descript, D-E-S-C-R-I-P-T. And okay. you can, that'll do transcription. But also Google has Live Transcribe that'll, you know, transcribe as you're talking. Um, so that might be something to look at. It has an app that runs on your phone. Uh, there's a lot of options nowadays, and Dragon, I think, is losing ground. It was the big one for many years, but I think there's a whole lot of other options now, too. So, something to check out. Well, thank you for the recommendations. I'll definitely look into those. So, what other software do you happen to use? Do you use Word or Scrivener, or what do you use for your other writing? Oh, I, I have the basic Word program. Okay. Uh, I know a lot of people, it seems to be most of the authors I talk to, it's either Word or Scrivener. Um, a few have used like Google, but mostly Word and Scrivener. Everyone sticks with the basics. <laughs> um, 
so what are you or Inkshare doing to market your book? What are some things you've done to market? Inkshare has reached out to a lot of Goodreads uh, readers, Goodreads reviewers, and sent out galleys in the month prior to Smithy being published. So I got a lot of advanced reviews that way. They also circulated the book among uh, different literary and horror magazines. I, I got a starred review in the Library Journal in April. Nice. I also had a review in Nightmare Magazine and Horror DNA. Um, Inkshares has also helped to arrange a book signing. I had a book signing at Dark Delicacies in Burbank, which is a, a very well-known horror genre uh, store. Not just books, they also sell other types of collectibles, uh, but it's very popular out here in Southern California, and I was very fortunate to have a signing there in July. I myself have tried to reach out to the various libraries in my community. I'm, I'm located at a nexus of multiple different cities, so there are about six different library districts within a 10 mile radius. And prior to the pandemic, I was very active in the different libraries. I would attend library programming and book clubs put on by the library. So my first inclination was to go to the library and introduce myself and see if they would consider having a program. I did have a program earlier this month at the North Torrance Library, uh, but that was the only one so far that's, that's taken a bite. Um, some of the libraries that I visited did end up acquiring Smithy for their collection, so people are reading it that way. Um, but I haven't really had much luck myself with getting libraries or even local bookstores to, to stock it. I went to the Barnes & Noble across from my office when the book first came out and they agreed to stock it, but when those books sold out, they didn't replace them, much to my surprise. I would think that if, if the merchandise is moving, you would want to keep it on the shelf, but yeah. uh, perhaps I'll try again now. Now we're in the Halloween season, maybe there will be more of an interest in reading some spooky ghost stories. Right, right. Did you at least get a picture of your book on the shelf at Barnes & Noble? I did, yes. I got a picture of it on the end cap with a number of other uh, much more popular horror writers. So oh. for a little while, I was on the shelf with Stephen King and, and Josh Mallerman and Grady Hendrix. Oh, well, that's awesome. I think that's pretty great. I mean, that right there, uh, I, you know, I would put that picture on my website. I, I carry it in my wallet, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should do that. Thanks for that suggestion. Yeah, there you go. I, and if you want to send it uh, along to me, I'll put it up on the show notes when uh, the episode goes live. That would be awesome. I oh, thank you. Authors would love to see something like that. Give them a little inspiration that, look, you can do it. And I, I hear Barnes & Noble now have an uh, edict that the local managers can choose to put local authors and stuff on the shelves as opposed to whatever corporate dictates. So I think that's great opportunity for other authors. I haven't checked into it, but that's what I hear. Yes, it's interesting that you mentioned that. Now, my book, Smithy, takes place in Newport, Rhode Island, not in Los Angeles, uh, but I visit Newport yearly. And on my last visit there in July, they did have Smithy stashed in their, not their local author section, but their local interest section. And I was very thrilled to see it there. I felt like I'd been validated, like I, I, I was accepted by Newport. Nice. That's great. I, I love that. Congratulations on that. Thank you. So uh, before we get going, uh, and this has been a lot of great discussions, especially about Inkshare, which I think some other authors listening may be very interested. Um, do you have any other advice for some new author out there that may be struggling just to get their first book done and published? As far as the writing goes, that's just something you have to keep at it. I, I would write in the evenings after work. I would stay up until one in the morning sometimes trying to get my personal quota of pages in. Um, as far as submitting your book, I, I have submitted to other publishers, uh, other novels that I have. Um, pay attention to what the publisher's guidelines are. Uh, look at to see what types of stories they are taking. If they mention that they're not taking whatever you've written, don't submit to them. Uh, make sure you're submitting to a publisher who's going to be open-minded. So don't don't submit a short story collection to a publisher who only write who only publishes uh, nonfiction, for instance. Uh, and definitely pay attention to whatever the rules are as far as how your manuscript should look. If they say use a certain font or a certain size font, make sure you do that because I've heard of a of authors whose manuscripts have been rejected on first sight just if the author can see that you didn't uh, follow the the layout requirements. Right, and, and that's big. If they get 100 and, you know, 90 of them follow the rules, the 10 that don't, 
they're not even going that slow. So don't be one of those. Two. Yes, I, I've, I've heard that their goal is to get rid of manuscripts, not necessarily to find the ones they want to publish, but to eliminate as many as possible to winnow down that big slush pile. So right. don't end up in the slush. Right. Yep. All right. Great. Well, Amanda, uh, I know you uh, rushed home from work uh, to do uh, this interview, and I appreciate that. Uh, that there's inspiration for authors there working full time and still writing, getting on interviews. So it can be done. People can do it. Uh, even in LA. <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciate you being on. It was great talking to you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. I really appreciate talking with you, Stephen. Thank you for listening to Discovered Wordsmiths. Come back next week and listen to another author discuss the road they've traveled and maybe sometime in the near future, it might be you.